Hi there folks, uh, this is Geology Professor Sean Wilsey. Today is July 24th and I wanted to put together a brief little update or I suppose an addendum to the video I posted yesterday on the hydrothermal explosion that occurred in Yellowstone National Park yesterday on July 23rd. Um, I won't go through the video and show the eruption again. You can go to my my video that will be linked in the video description if you want to see that again. But I do want to respond to some of the comments that were made and maybe explain a little bit better exactly how this event occurred and also why I called it fairly small and also common. A lot of people took exception. They didn't agree with that. And so I'm hoping I can use some evidence and data here to perhaps show you why I use that verbiage there. And of course, you know, using small and um, common, those of course come with some perspective or, or context of course. So this of course is where the damage was done along the boardwalk here. I showed these these pictures yesterday. This is from the National Park Service. Um, but in saying that these things happen pretty commonly in Yellowstone National Park, uh, I thought I'd go to the most recent event which happened just this past April in the Norris Geyser Basin. So I'll put links to all these under the video description if you want to digest this a little bit more. But the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory puts out a weekly article. So this is the article from uh, July 22nd, which ironically was this past week. And so what this goes through is they noticed an area in the Norris Geyser Basin that looked a little bit different. Once like the, the snow had melted and, and thawed and uh, they were able to get back in here along the trail system, there was some blocks of material, a crater uh, in an area around the uh, porcelain terrace in the Norris Geyser Basin. So you can see uh, there's a little crater here. There's these blocks of sinter. This white stuff here is the mineralized uh, material that when the, the geyser or hot spring uh, pushes hot water to the surface it's carrying dissolved silica and that dissolved silica will precipitate at the surface as the water evaporates and form the layers the terraces you see in the area different than mammoth terrace and mammoth hot springs in the northern part of the park which is made out of travertine most of the hydrothermal features in Yellowstone because that hot water is moving through rhyolite a, a volcanic rock that's rich in silica you get this very silica rich uh, white or light gray material around it called sinter and that's what this material is. So um, anyway so they noticed there was some differences here since they'd been there the last time and so what they did next was pulled up some of the satellite data so you can see here on April 2nd that you can actually see uh, those hot springs those pools on the porcelain terrace here they show up as visible pools um, but then a few weeks later during the next satellite pass over this area you can see that those were dried out a little bit and you can I mean it's really small in here but there you can pick out where this explosion crater had occurred um, so I don't want to get into the details too much about this specific event but just to show you that these this scale of event happens more often than you might think in, in Yellowstone National Park. Remember that the one that happened just yesterday occurred because people were visiting the area. It was right there in a visited area. It was during the day. People had cameras and therefore it was documented really well. Most of these events in Yellowstone happen at other times, might be at night, might be in the winter when there's not a lot of people in the park or in just a few parts of the park, and also in more remote areas rather than you know boardwalk, heavily visited areas. So uh, I've got it, some other data here to share with you. So here's an article, and again, this is free access, so I'll show put a link to this. But I have two articles I want to use here to, um, I guess, provide a little bit more evidence for my assertion that these are fairly common um, and you know relatively small on the grand scheme of things so here's our first article here from 2014 dynamics of the yellowstone hydrothermal system um, and let's just go ahead and skip down you know lots of good stuff in here but let's skip down to the section on hydrothermal activity and hydrothermal explosions so we'll come down here to section seven, I believe it is. Yeah, geysers and hydrothermal explosions. Again, let's go right down to the section that most pertains to us here. So I'll just uh, read this for you directly, just these two paragraphs here. Hydrothermal explosions are among the most significant hazards at Yellowstone. At least 20 large, large hydrothermal explosion craters with dimensions ranging between 100 and 2,800 meters in diameter and numerous smaller craters have developed 
on the caldera and along the Norse Mammoth Corridor over the past 16,000 years. Deposits from these explosions extend to distances that are greater than the diameter of their source craters. Rock fragments were ejected at least as far as 3 to 4 kilometers from the Mary Bay Crater Rim around 13,600 years ago, and fragments from the Indian Pool Explosion Crater are found as, as far as 6 kilometers from the vent. So this is, talks about some of the bigger events. So if you wanted to know what, what does a big hydrothermal explosion look like in the Yellowstone area, this gives you some uh, quantification there. So less frequent, as you might imagine, these bigger events are less frequent, but this gives you some ideas of how big those craters are, how big they throw uh, their, their ejecta or debris. Uh, here's the part we want to get to here. At least 26 small hydrothermal explosions have been documented in the historic record of the National Park. And the park's been around for around 130 years or so. These events include either the formation of a new crater or significant enlargement of an existing crater by explosive excavation. The largest historical hydrothermal explosions at Yellowstone occurred between 1881 and 1890 at Excelsior Geyser and the Midway Geyser Basin. Uh, and they give you a little bit more uh, information there. Um, so a little bit there and then this is probably the better reference here. So this is a 2007 USGS open file report. Again I'll put this up anyone can access this uh, that talks about hazards volcanic and hydrothermal hazards uh, in Yellowstone National Park. Let's, so this is 2007 so let's keep in mind this is uh, about 17 years old uh, but let's go to the hydrothermal explosion section which is on page 29. So we'll come down here. Uh, I'll make this a little bit bigger for you. So how often do they occur? For several reasons, it's difficult to estimate the frequency with which hydrothermal explosions occur at Yellowstone National Park. First, there's no clear demarcation between a forceful geyser eruption that ejects mud and rock fragments and a more energetic explosion that creates a new crater. Uh, second, there's not a comprehensive catalog of explosive events. Uh, I'll take you to table four here in a second, but the, looking at the historic uh, documented explosive events, there's been 26 examples of hydrothermal explosions in the past 126 years. Um, let's see, do, 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 do. however, let's see. Yeah, nearly all of the explosions in table four occurred at thermal areas close to roads where visitors are most frequent and the likelihood of observations of an actual explosion or of recent deposits is highest. So there's a little bit of a bias here, right, in how, how many of these we actually have um, record of. Uh, it's likely that similar explosions are much more frequent than tabulated in Table 4. A conservative estimate would be that at least one rock hurling explosion occurs every two years at Yellowstone. Because these events are typically small and occur at any time of year, including when visitors are present, the likelihood of harm to any individual park visitor is small. So if you kind of look at this, the statistics, crunch the numbers, give it an analysis mathematically, the chances of you getting hurt from a small hydrothermal explosion in Yellowstone is quite small. You're must, much more likely to get probably, you know, uh, impacted by the wildlife or in a car crash or something like that. Uh, for example, while the annual probability of a small hydrothermal explosion within the park, assuming one eruption every two years, is 0.5, if visitors are generally absent from geyser basins at night and between December and March, of course that's winter time, then the annual probability of an explosion that could cause personal injury falls to, and you can see some of the math here. Um, so what they're trying to do here is show that it, it's it's a it's a low, uh, it's common, but it, it to any given visitor to the park, uh, that would be pretty small in terms of the probability of it uh, impacting you. Um, Larger events clearly represent a greater threat to park visitors and infrastructure. So even though they're less frequent, um, they're of such a size and um, you know their impacts are so much more widespread that they could provide much more uh, of a um, tangible threat to visitors. So um, yeah, so I thought I'd show you that and we can jump down here to uh, table four, which lists all the uh, hydrothermal explosion craters in Yellowstone. This is the large one, so these are the bigger ones that they've documented. Uh, and then there's a list, here's table four, some historic hydrothermal explosion craters in Yellowstone. So from whenever the park's inception in the late 1800s through 2007 when this report was put together, you can see the list of the location, what region it's in, um, the age, and then there's a reference there. So um, this was, again, just to kind of help um, maybe 
provide some more information about how common these are because they do happen more often than you think it's just as you're generally not people standing right there in the summer when it's typically visited uh, you know during the day that sort of thing and I'll also link to this article as well on hydrothermal explosions in Yellowstone National Park uh, they even have one here I mean what's this this is from 2018 uh, there's one right there in the Biscuit Basin so there's one that we actually have a photo of I'm not sure exactly when that one took place I could look that up um, but they talk a little bit about you know uh, these systems and why they occur so and just real quick related to that um, you know why this event actually occurred now that hopefully I've convinced you a little bit of um, the frequency that they are more common than you might think uh, with these hydrothermal systems this is for an area in New Zealand so don't worry about the name there but we typically have three types of hydrothermal features we have fumaroles which just emit steam so this kind of looks like water on this diagram but just this is just steam that comes out of these geysers which shoot up pressurized water periodically and episodically uh, and then hot springs or pools that uh, are much more tranquil here. And so the idea here and the at least one thought or possibility about why this event in Yellowstone occurred is that remember this is hot water moving through this system. Um, the plumbing system of these things can be kind of complicated. A lot of times with geysers there's constrictions in the plumbing system that allows the pressure to build up. All this water is being heated by the hot rock below. Um, and it wants to rise because it's buoyant and low density and it's also has a lot of dissolved silica in it so the the, the acidic water uh, and the heat of the water allows it to dissolve the surrounding rocks so it's carrying quite a bit of mineralized material you know in most parts of Yellowstone that would be silica and so what it can do is the water sitting here is it can actually mineralize and coat the conduits and that over times can make the constrictions tighter and eventually plug up the system a little bit and then of course this hot water continues to um, build up the water can actually exceed the boiling point because it's under pressure and then if there's a quick pressure drop that can cause all that water to flash into steam that takes up more space that's an expansive process and that's what actually causes the explosion and the eruption that takes place um, like we saw yesterday. So hopefully that was helpful. Again, I just wanted to provide a little bit more information as a follow-up to what I presented uh, yesterday. I will put links to all these in the video description and I encourage you to read the, through these uh, and educate yourselves a little bit more about hydrothermal explosions in Yellowstone, how they occur and how often they occur. Thanks again for your support of the channel. Hope this was helpful to you and have a great day.